Hey everyone, welcome to the E2 Effective Elders podcast. E2 is devoted to coaching your elder team to win by providing biblical and practical resources in authentic relationships. E2 wants nothing more than to equip you to move God's kingdom forward in the place you're serving Jesus. Visit us at e2elders.org and please share this good word with others. Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in to our E2 podcast today and how grateful we are to CDF Capital for their continuing investment in elders across the country and around the world. Uh, thank you, CDF, for making our podcast possible. And today we welcome Kent Fillinger. And Kent is a regional vice president with yet another one of our partners, CFR, Christian Financial Resources. How are you doing today, Kent? Doing great. How are you doing, Gary? Doing fine. Thank you for the partnership. And, you know, we had a great time uh, with you and your team last week filming not one, but two virtual conferences. Yeah, we're very excited about that. We are grateful to be able to partner with E2 on that project and really looking forward to how the Healthy Elder uh, Conference and the Jumpstart Conference are going to help a lot of churches across the country uh, in their mission and the work they're doing. Absolutely. And uh, so in October, late October, we're going to deploy Healthy Elder uh, virtually. And in January, uh, during those snowy months, we're going to deploy Jumpstart virtually. So thank you for making that possible. Truly, we're, we're very grateful. Yeah. Now, no, 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 no. Uh, yep, real quick, just to set up our conversation. So we are in these uh, six podcasts that are unpacking the, the six challenges that face elders. And it doesn't matter where the elder team is located, uh, whether in the Pacific Northwest or the Northeast, the Midwest, the same six challenges are always facing elders. And we've made it very easy, E-L-D-E-R-S. Evangelism, leadership, discipleship, equipping the existing elder team, recruiting new elders, and S, structure within the church. Last week, uh, we had a visit with Tim Cole of Waypoint Church Partners, and he unpacked evangelism. This week, we're going to count on you for that letter L, leadership challenges that elders face. And by the way, elders and leaders, remember, Staples, they gave us this button. Remember that? We, we push easy. Was easy. Uh, <laughs> we've made it easy for you. If you go to our website and on our landing page in the lower left corner, you will see an elders help button. And we have uh, harvested from our many books. We have harvested from our video, video collection of leadership lessons resources for each of the six challenges. We've made it easy for you. And all you have to do is go to that uh, prompt and it will open a page in our E2 store to download these, these digital files to help you. We've made it easy to find some resources uh, instantly on our website to help you move the church forward in each of these six areas. Now, Kent's going to help us on this leadership issue. And uh, Kent, c c first of all, could you please talk to us about how elders, leaders in the church, need to think and act differently than those who are in the secular setting? Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, uh, elders, especially as they lead the church, need to really evaluate how they are thinking and how they are acting. And oftentimes, I think it's so easy uh, because elders oftentimes have a you know two feet in the business world or two feet in the uh, you know the secular realm that oftentimes they kind of transport that thinking or those mindsets right into the church. And I uh, you know always like uh, what uh, you know Peter Drucker said years ago that the goal of leaders not to think more business like but to be uh, think more church like. And as elders, we need to continue to evaluate how we're thinking and how we're acting. Came across a great little matrix recently from Eric Geiger that kind of unpacks this that I thought was really good. I'm going to try to hold it up here so you can see it. But you can see here the idea of uh, elder, uh, elders and leaders in terms of how they think they can think and act small to big 
And they, you know, and, and you, and, uh, we want to unpack that. So you just kind of see the first way that elders can think and act is this idea of being an apathetic leader. And an apathetic mm-hmm. leader is one who thinks small, but, uh, you know, acts big. And, uh, and therefore, you know, as a result, they're not as effective in their leadership uh, as they could be. And, and uh, you know, sometimes they're holding on to their position uh, as a result of that as they act big but they really don't have much of a vision for the church, uh, you know, and I think that's unfortunate. And I think oftentimes we see that in the business world. We also see the arrogant leader. The arrogant leader up here is one who is uh, acting big and thinking big. And, uh, you know, and that's the person who says, you know, they're, they're proud of the fact that they're an elder. Uh, they're trying to remind people they're an elder and they maybe have a lot of big ideas, but a lot of times they're just really trying to, to seek attention uh, for themselves, and they're not really, uh, you know, maximizing the opportunities and roles that God has given to them uh, in the church. And then this is what I, the, the, down here we see the uh, the reluctant or the insecure leader, uh, one who, uh, you know, thinks small and acts small. Uh, and I think from my experience, I've seen this a lot uh, with church elders. They're humble. The men, they have heart for the Lord, uh, but they just don't have much vision for the church. And so therefore, they small and they act small. And sometimes that's because maybe they're a newer elder. Uh, maybe they, they're, they're, they've really grown their confidence in their leadership. Uh, maybe they're insecure because they really don't understand who they are and who God's kind of designed them to be and how God did them to lead in the church. And as a result, they're reluctant or they're insecure. And I think, you know, those are the elders who, again, humble men, but they don't really have a vision for the church. Uh, I was like what Jim Collins said years ago. Jim wrote the book Good to Great, but he also said that every leader needs to have a big B hag. He called them big, holy, yes. aud- big, hairy, audacious goals. And I always like to flip that and say it needs to be a big, holy, audacious goal. But when was the last time, <laughs> you know, a, a church leader, an elder had a big, holy, audacious goal for their church? Yeah. You know, a, a dream that's bigger than themselves, a, a dream that God's calling them to. To really try to say, okay, what is God calling us to do? And then I, the the key that we really want to humble in, on, you know, hone in on is being a humble leader. Mm-hmm. And the leader, and I know E two talks a lot about this. Is that's the the humble leader is one who acts small. Mm-hmm. They recognize that God is really in charge of the mission of the church. That they're not the one who is driving the bat, but they think big. They have a vision for the church because they know God has called them to do more and to be more, and that He can empower them and and transform them to help them do that. Mm-hmm. I think every leader needs to kind of assess where they are at in that spectrum. You know, are they an arrogant leader who's acting big and thinking big? Are they an apathetic leader? It's, you know, are they a reluctant or insecure leader or they're a humble leader? And a humble leader is one who doesn't lead from a high position. They lead from a humble position. Right. And I think that's where you're going to see the greatest level of effectiveness is when you're able to lead with that humility. And again, that's not the way the world teaches us to lead. Uh, so most of your leadership books that you're going to read, uh, especially some of the stuff from 10, 15 years ago, was all about, you know, taking charge and, you know, being the man and all those types of things. But that is really oftentimes antithetical, really what it means to be a humble leader. I go back to, to Matthew you know, 11, 29 a lot. And I think about this because, you know, Jesus said, take my yoke upon you because it's easy and light. He, he says, for I am humble and gentle in heart. And I. I, you know, we can't be the lie of the world. We can't be the great shepherd always. We can't be uh, the bread of life, but we all can model and follow Jesus in those two characteristics of what he said he was like. He was humble and gentle in heart. And as leaders, I think that's key, especially for elders, to lead with humility, to lead with a level of gentleness, not a weakness, but that meekness that God calls us to, mm-hmm. uh, the Beatitudes. And I think that's what's going to set elders apart because that's not the way most leaders in the world are functioning today, but it's really the way God's called us to lead the church from the beginning of time. Yeah, you know, uh, again, in Matthew, when you make mention of Matthew 11, in Matthew 28, we often quote the the, uh, Great Commission, and we begin in verse 19. We have to back up into verse 18, where Jesus says, all authority in Mm -hmm. heaven and earth has been given to me. Well, as you say, many times in leadership, we have people uh, defaulting to, hey, I'm in a position of authority. I'm at the top of the food chain. Yeah, Jesus had all authority, 
but he modeled complete humility. Exactly. And if we're going to lead like Jesus, uh, then we have to understand, yes, we've been given authority, but we also have this incredible responsibility to lead the church in all humility. So uh, that, exactly. that is a leadership challenge. Yeah, it really is. And that's a servant leadership. I, you know, uh, Ken Blanchard, I, I don't know if he said it first, but I heard him say it. You know, humility isn't thinking less of yourself, but it's thinking of yourself less. Mm-hmm. And I think that's so key for leaders that, again, it's not, a, it's not being that reluctant or insecure leader because that's not really leadership. Uh, you know, not really humility. Sometimes it's a false humility. And really true humility is exactly what you said. It's having authority, but exercising in a way that demonstrates a servant leadership uh, and demonstrates that, that leading from a, a place of humility. But it also means thinking big. And it also means dreaming big dreams for the church and moving the church in a, in a directional uh, way that's helping to, to move the church forward and accomplishing its mission, not just sitting there and saying, you know, let's kind of huddle together and be humble, you know, humble people in a position of leadership, but actually humble leaders who are moving the church forward. Right. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Good point. Hey, um, what's the difference between leading and managing? Yeah, I think that's a key distinctive as well that uh, we need to understand because I think it's easy to uh, think we're leading, but in reality, we're really managing. I think we need to see better leading in the church and less managing because my experience as I've worked with churches as a consultant, as I've visited churches in my role with CFR, is that most churches are overmanaged and underled. And oh, uh, say, that, say that again. That's a very powerful statement. Yeah, most churches are over-managed and under-led. And, uh, you know, leading means that you're focusing on vision, you're focusing on values, and you're helping to, to, to communicate that, those vision and values to uh, the congregation. When you're managing, you're focusing on analysis, on problem solving, and on planning, and you get mired in the muck and the details. And as a result, sometimes, you you know, it's that whole idea of, are you, uh, you know, are you uh, doing the right things? Or are you doing the things right? And, uh, you know, and I think it's always important to make sure that we're doing the right things and that we're, we're moving forward. And that requires uh, leadership. And so often I think, you know, that idea of managing an analysis, I've seen so many elderships just get stuck in that paralysis of analysis and they talk and they talk ad nauseum and, you know, they're constantly trying to say, well, what should we do and where should we go? but they never lead. Nobody ever says, here's where we're going and we're going to move forward in a direction. I mean, uh, you know, sometimes it's better to, better to have a ready fire aim than it is to always just say, let's re- be ready and let's aim, but we're never going to fire. And, and leadership means we're, we're moving forward. We, we've got a vision uh, and, you know, it's a, and a vision is really a pragmatic dream. It's a dream that can be implemented. And we need to make sure uh, that nothing becomes dynamic unless it becomes specific. And, uh, and I think so often, again, elders get into that position and they want to manage the staff and they want to manage the, you know, uh, the direction of, uh, you know, the church, but the, nothing, nobody's leading, nobody's making anything happen. And so I see management as a default position that leads to stagnation. Mm-hmm. I see leadership as a directed plan that creates progress. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, you know. I just think, you know, again, that there's a distinctive there that's huge. Yeah, when when you mention the difference, the huge difference between managing and leading, it is easier to manage. Yes, you're to be down in the weed. Yep, uh, um, majoring in the minors. Exactly. And yet, one of our names in Greek for elders is episkopos, and it means overseer. And elders need to be at thirty six thousand feet mm. over the ministry of the church, not down in the weeds, managing. So yeah, that's a, exactly. a great challenge that you give to all of us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And again, that comes back to that vision and values, thinking and looking longer term. That's a great way to say it. Because uh, again, the default position is let's just manage. Let's have our hands on everything. Let's control it. And we don't delegate anything. And we feel like we're accomplishing something. But really what we're doing is just you know creating and producing stagnation leadership movement and forward action and actually, you know, uh, moving the ball down the field. And that's harder work, much harder. Mm-hmm. We need yeah. elders who are leaders, not elders who 
or managers. And, and, and my research has shown that a lot of elders say that they're not involved in the day-to-day operations. You know, three-fourths of, or more said in an uh, elder survey that they, they, they don't get involved in day-to-day operations. But my experience has been that that's not really the case. <laughs> they're, they're really, they're, they think they're leading, but they're really not. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and you said three out of four, right? Yeah, basically three out of four said we don't get involved in day-to-day operations. But in, in essence, in their elders' means, they want to know, why do we spend this much money on that? And how, why, you know, what, what about this plan? And tell us more about that. And it's all management. It's not leadership. Right. Yeah. No, we, we want to look at those bids for the repaving of the parking lot or the, hey, the new air conditioning system. We want to see what those bids are. That's right. right. And we feel self-satisfied because we're protecting the church and we're being good stewards, but we're not being elders. We're not being Episcopos who are leading the flock. And, uh, and again, you can spend uh, elders means hours talking about, yeah, the parking lot of the roof or the HVAC system, and that's management. That's not leadership. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, one of the challenges of L leadership in these days is uh, the flock is so scattered because of COVID uh, yeah. and, um, uh, and even pre-COVID, you, you know, uh, one of the national statistics, uh, 1.7 times a month. People were attending church 1.7 times a month pre-COVID. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now it, it's even going to be worse uh, right. in the midst of and after COVID. So how can elders lead more effectively when the flock is so scattered? Yeah, I think that's a key thing to key in on. And a couple other uh, stats to go along with the 1.7 just saw uh, in the last week that of church going folks who have been watching online, 50% of millennials, uh, that's 39, you know, to about 20 something uh, age group, those with young families by and large, have stopped watching online church. Mm-hmm. About a third of baby busters, Gen X, which is my category, have stopped watching online. And, and almost a 23%, almost a fourth of baby boomers, uh, your generation have also opted out of even online church. And so yeah, the, the flock that was already a little bit, you know, sketchy has become even more, uh, you know, uh, scattered and, and out there. And so I think, you know, first coming to the realization awareness that that's the reality. And then, uh, you know, saying, okay, how are we going to combat that? How are we going to, to try to offset that? And, uh, you know, I think, um, you know, it's going to COVID and the pandemic are going to reshape how we do church. I mean, I don't know where we're going to land you know, post pandemic, but I think as elders, they elders are not going to ever stop having the responsibility to shepherd the flock. And, uh, and, and so uh, I came across this, uh, this concept of the lonely crowd sociologist, uh, David Reisman in the 1950s coined that phrase lonely crowd to describe collectives of people who live according to common traditions and conforming values, but who barely know or like each other. And I thought, man, that that sounds like a lot of churches I know. Uh You know, they show up on Sunday because they, you know, have these uh, common traditions and conforming values, but you know, the friendly church that most people like to tout isn't really all that friendly, especially to outsiders and oftentimes even to each other. And, uh, and so that's not enough in this day and age to say we're a friendly church and that's what's going to help, you know, kind of win the day. And so I think elders need to start thinking about how can they uh, begin equipping people in this idea of friendship making and leading the way in that effort. I mean, I think we have to, elders have to start to tout togetherness. They have to start fostering friendship. They have to start training people to listen. They have to model vulnerability. They have to activate affinity groups. Uh, because people are are scattered more than ever, and uh, and so I think we're going to need a lot of search and rescue missions after uh, the, the pandemic is over for these elders to go out and find their sheep. Where have they wandered off to? Can we invite them back in? I I was looking up at the in the Merrick uh, Veterinary Manual recently about the characteristics of sheep, and uh, and the the Veterinary Manual said that sheep are intensely. Uh, gregarious and talkative and social, and that allows them to bond closely to other sheep and uh, that they preferentially, uh, you know, like to find related uh, flock members. And uh, that even sheep require four to five other 
you know, sheep, uh, when they're in a kind of maintaining a visual contact of kind of saying, okay, I'm eating, I need to see four or five other sheep. I thought, how many times probably in a church do we need to have four or five other friends for us mm-hmm. to and stay at yeah. a church and, uh, and, and helping to, you know, say, okay, how are we going to make sure this happens? You know, sheep have a strong flocking in, uh, instinct. They feel safer when they're gathered together. Sheep need other sheep to feel safe. And if you separate one sheep out from the rest of the flock, uh, it's disturbing and frightening to that sheep. And so you think about Jesus, you know, leaving the 99 to go uh, find the one. And so it's being in that, that flock, that's what protects the sheep from predators, uh, you know. And, uh, and so how can we make sure as elders, we're making sure people stay in the flock so that they're not you know, falling to temptation of sin and people leading them astray. You know, the Bible never says that we're supposed to be a lone wolf, but also we can't be a lone sheep, you know, because mm-hmm. we're designed to be in a flock. And the third thing I learned from looking at this uh, veterinary manual is that sheep will follow a leader. Sheep will mm-hmm. follow someone they know and they trust. Mm-hmm. And so as an elder, you have to ask yourself, do my people in the church, do they know me and do they trust me? Well, if you lead with your heart, then people can connect with you. And if they connect with you, then they're going to trust you. And if they trust you, then they're going to follow you. Mm-hmm. And you can turn that around and say it the other way. If people, people won't follow leaders, they don't trust. And they can't trust someone that they don't connect with. And they can't connect with a leader when they can't find their heart. Mm-hmm. As elders, as church leaders, we need to make sure that we're modeling vulnerability, that we're modeling taking time to listen and really listen to people and understand their needs. I've, I've heard of a couple of churches where the elders and staff during the pandemic, they've just divided up the congregation and they've been making phone calls and sending emails and text messages to connect with their members and just to listen. Sometimes that's been a, a, a one minute, hey, we're doing good. Other times that's been a, hey, let me tell you about my job and why I'm so stressed out right now. And it's an hour long conversation. But when was the last time as an elder, did you take time to listen to someone in your flock? When was the last time you connected with them? When was the last time you shared your heart and said, you know, I'm worried about my family too, or I'm concerned about, you know, this or that uh, so that people can again have that heart level understanding, the connection, the trust, and then they're going to follow. People are going to follow the leader that they know and they trust. And so I think we've got a lot of work to do as elders just to teach people what does it mean? part of the flock and how can we be, you know, effective leaders of the flock? If we don't know the flock, we're not going to be. Right. You know, um, Barna came out with a report a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if you saw it or not, but um, they said from their research that a third of people have left their pre COVID church. Yeah. One third. So when you yeah. talk about elders going after uh, it's very important as shepherds. Again, one of those three Greek words in the New Testament for elder, poimain, it means shepherd. Yep. And if we have sheep that have wandered off, we do need to intentionally go after. You know, I think that COVID has shown to us the shallow commitment of people, not just to the local church, but more importantly to Jesus. Yeah, And we need to, as leaders, speak boldly, directly, courageously about what it means to be fully surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We cannot beat around the bush. Yeah, I believe that it's very important as elders, a leadership challenge will be in these months, weeks, to be very direct in our conversation with sheep as Mm -hmm. to... Are you going to be a part of this flock? Yeah. Uh, and if not, are you going to be fully engaged, rooted in a flock that is God honoring uh, and Christ exalting? So, yeah. exactly. That, very we can, leadership days. Yeah. And we can't just expect them to wander back when <laughs> this is all over. I mean, it, uh, uh, I've seen various research about how long it takes to develop a habit. I mean, the old adage is 21 days. I think it's right. actually. Most research says it's closer to 28 or 30 plus days where you have to do some. But you think about people are having months now of losing the habit of being together, of studying God's word together, of coming together for worship, uh, you know, coming together to serve. And so I think churches are going to have to be creative even during the pandemic. How can we get small flocks of people together to do things? 
uh, as people are comfortable, you know, and that may be online, that may be in person, but we, I think, are still so focused right now on the Sunday morning worship experience and our people listening to that. But I think we're going to have to, re, you know, kind of flip the script and say, okay, how are we helping to connect members of the flock with each other to help mm-hmm. during this time? Because, yeah, it's a definitely a challenging time. It, it is revealing some commitments that we thought maybe were better than they really were. And, yeah, if some wandered off to another flock, are we going to go after them? Are we going to really, as a shepherd, know where they are? And, again, share our heart for them to be part of our flock moving forward. You know, you just mentioned uh, those four elements, and as you were doing so, that made me think of Acts 2.42. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they devoted themselves there in Jerusalem to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And that the, the key word there is the word devoted. It's not the four mm-hmm. activities. It's the word devoted. It's a yeah. present participle. And they with unrelenting zeal, unrelenting devotion. They were in the word of God. They were doing life together in the deepest of community. They were sharing meals that always had the element of remembering the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, the Lord's Supper, and prayer. They were constant in prayer with one another. And elders need to lead by example in these four zealous, unrelenting activities, body of Christ. They they didn't have a pandemic then, but they had persecution. They were right. being burned at stake. They were being uh, carried off and incarcerated. They were giving their lives uh, as devoted followers of Jesus. So we are facing a pandemic. They were facing persecution. Yeah. And you talk about 12 apostles leading by example in Jerusalem. It was off the chart. Yeah. You saying that things makes me think, you know, right now there's parents who are creating what they're calling learning pods uh, mm-hmm. or other families that they're going to basically, if, you know, school gets shut down or even when the school is starting online, where they're going to say, okay, we're close by or we have, you know, kids similar age and we're going to become a pod where we're, we know because we're together that probably we haven't gotten, you know, pin, the, the COVID-19 entered into our system. And what would it be if a church created these, you know, devoted pods of, you know, two or three, four families that are going to get together to do exactly Acts 242 life. Maybe while they're not feeling comfortable getting together with hundreds at their church, they're going to say these five or six families are going to band together, study God's word, break bread together, pray, and be devoted to God in a, in a different way while we're, we're surviving this pandemic together. And again, I think that requires leadership. That's not going to happen on its own. It requires elders stepping out, leading the way to say, I'm going to find my own pod that I'm going to help to create, lead the way, and then challenge others to do the same so that we can make sure we stay together as a flock, even in the midst of persecution, a pandemic, or whatever may come our way. Yep. Awesome. Hey, uh, Kent, if people had a question for you, uh, what's your email address? They can email me at Kent, K-E-N-T, at CFRministry.org. And would love to answer any questions I could. Yep. Kent at CFRministry.org. That'd be yes. great. And for uh, all of you who are listening and you've not met Kent before, I want to connect the dots here. So in the Christian Standard, every year we have these articles about the what, what's happened in churches, the size of churches, uh, ministry that's happening, but also Every month, there's a column by Kent in the Christian Standard, and Kent is our numbers crunching guy. He is all about statistics. God has given to him the gift and the ability to take statistics and to discern them with meaningful application. Uh, there are some of us who call this guy Dr. Data, and uh, he's he's got this gift of taking data and making it meaningful in life. So I want you to understand this is the Kent Fillinger who is always in the Christian standard. So Kent, I'm I'm truly grateful that God has given you that penchant, that ability to take numbers and help them mean, mean something in our lives. You know, it's a real gift. A real yeah, gift. well, and uh, there's an old quote I like to use. It says, research kills opinions. And so, uh, you know, I love... <laughs> 
I would much rather make decisions based off good information than, uh, you know, a, a bad taco that I ate the other night and, uh, you know, gut feel. And, uh, and that's one of the reasons why I do that is to hopefully give the informational tools to, to church leaders to be able to make better decisions, more informed decisions, because I just think it's the a better way to, to lead a, 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 and serve a church if you're doing it based off of some information-based, you know, decision-making. Absolutely. Yeah, yep. my pleasure. I'm, it's great to be part of Christian Standard and their work there with the metrics column and all the research I get to do there and, and honored to be uh, contributing here today with E2. Thank you so very much. Hey, have a great day, Kent. And, yeah, and you too. Well. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, Gary.